Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches has a bold and beautiful tree for the landscape. We travel to Kingston, Oklahoma to visit with Leon Sloan about growing vegetables in hoop houses. In Oklahoma City, we visit a school garden at Millwood Elementary. And urban forester Mark Bays takes us on one tree's journey to becoming a table. Another great Oklahoma shade tree we want to share with you today and this is called the Kentucky coffee tree. It is native to Oklahoma and as the common name alludes to the fact that they used to brew the seeds for coffee. While the Native Americans used to brew this as a coffee-like beverage, I wouldn't recommend it because it is toxic until these are roasted at a certain temperature. You can see this particular tree does have seed pods on it, which actually are really ornamental, especially in the wintertime, giving you some interest in the landscape. They almost have a leathery appearance to them. And this particular one is a female tree, so you're going to get those seed pods. Now some people might not like those, especially if they're having to mow around them, because they can get quite hard and dull your blades quickly. If you'd prefer a tree that doesn't have these seed pods, you might look for a cultivar called Espresso, as that is a selected male cultivar, so you will not get these fruits on it. Regardless whether you get a male or a female, it's going to have this light, airy kind of canopy to it. You can see how it just has these layers of foliage, still providing plenty of shade for you. Regardless of whether you get one that's native or a cultivar, the genus refers to naked branch, meaning that this tree is going to look like pretty much just a stick for a while until it really starts to fill out and create these layers of foliage. You can see by the pinnate foliage that it is a legume also, um, as you can see the pods hanging on it, alluding to the fact that it is in the legume family. Kentucky coffee trees can reach a height of about 60 feet and they're excellent for Oklahoma soils as they can handle high pH and also very dry conditions. in Kingston, Oklahoma, which is just east of Ardmore, and we are at Leon's Greenhouses, and joining us today is Leon Sloan, and Leon, you're kind of known for your hoop houses. Can you tell us a little bit about how you even got started with hoop houses? Well, I've been in the greenhouse business here for uh, 57 years, and in December of 99, my gas bill was $21,120 for uh, one month wow and i couldn't stand that any longer i knew i could not and i was growing flowers at that time instead of vegetables i had quit vegetables and went to flowers but i realized it was time for Mal to me to switch over to food because i can grow food without a high fuel bill mm -hmm. and so that's what we did in 2000 we started to growing food and we were growing it in containers that had holes in the bottom we had to water, you either get it too wet or not wet enough, and it's just a mess for everybody to have to worry about. So so tell me a little bit about what the hoop houses provided. I mean, obviously it was nice not having that electric bill that your greenhouses uh, offered, but tell me what you got for your plants with a hoop house, what sort of protection it provided. Well, it's, it's uh, protection from the weather. I mean, you, you don't have any heating in that. Mm -hmm. It's strictly a uh, just a coverage over your plants, but uh, we've learned how to use double row crop covers over them and uh, 
make it where it's not as cold in there because we can't afford the fuel, the price of the fuel to grow the food. So we have we have done that to keep the cold out. Right. And uh, we also have you know excessive hail. You need the protection from the hail on your crops. You need the protection from the high winds. We're getting some 70 to 80 mile hour winds now that blows the crops around and this stops the wind from blowing. I would suspect that you don't have as many pests grazing on your plants either. It does help the population until they, sometime they do get a population of aphids or something like that, okay. you know, that you can control pretty well. Uh, and the deer is another thing, you know, we've gotten so many deer in our country nowadays that we, uh, we're trying to keep them from eating our crops up so they don't come in these houses if you keep the doors closed or something like that. Right. And I, I would say, I mean, we just took our jackets to, off to come inside mm -hmm. here. It's late in November and we've already experienced, uh, you know, single digits almost right. uh, with freezes or feel like temperatures. Right. I mean, it's warm in here and there is no external um, electricity or heating. It's just passive heating. That's correct. There's no, no heat in here of any kind except for the sun shining through it. It does get cold in here in, in the nighttime. I mean, it's, but we've found out that when, and I didn't even cover these when it got down to 18 down here to last week. You see how the crops are still doing fine in here, even though we got down to 18 degrees. But if it's going to get down any colder than that, we will put a row crop cover over them okay. and give it another protection inside. Because we've even taken tomatoes down to 16 degrees and not lose them in 10 inches of snow outside wow. in 16 degrees. And we kept our tomato plants alive, and that was in February. So you're actually able to grow warm season crops almost year round in this hoop house. <sighs> Part of the year, let's play that. Okay. That's, that's, let's be honest. Definitely yeah. season extension. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we do. Yes, instead of waiting till April and May to put out your tomatoes, now we put them out the early part of February. Mm -hmm. And then also in the fall, when you start having to freeze, if I've got tomatoes or something growing or peppers, I can extend it on down another month or so with this high tunnel. So that's the reason. We think we need, or we know we need, these covers like this to extend our seasons. Well, I know hoop houses are becoming more and more popular because you don't need electricity to them, and so you're able to put them in different sites um, where you might not have electricity. I, I hear you're speaking at something coming up um, for people that might want more information about this. Well, yeah, it's coming up in January, I guess, in Tulsa, that uh, they're asking me to speak on a Friday afternoon about these uh, wicking buckets and about the uh, high tunnels. Uh huh. And so, uh, what what could people expect to hear from you, maybe at those that conference? Well, they've asked me to speak about how the seasons have changed from the time I was started gardening 75 years ago up until today. So that's what I'm going to try to bring to them is what how it has changed in the 75 years we're talking about. Well, it definitely has changed. And, and Leon, I've enjoyed hearing a lot of your stories and things like that, and also just learning from you. Okay. So uh, thank you for sharing, and we look forward to hearing uh, at the Horticulture Industry Show coming up in January. Thank you for coming to see me. The 2020 Oklahoma Horticulture Industry Show will be held January 10th and 11th at the Tulsa Tech Conference Center in Owasa, Oklahoma. This year's theme is Protected Ag, Adapting to a Challenging Environment. For more information, visit hortindustryshow.org.
I'm Mark Bays with Oklahoma Forestry Services, and on previous segments of Oklahoma Gardening, you've seen a lot of the traditional forestry activities that we have in our state. A lot of that is out in the eastern part and the southeastern part of the state. And we've seen that you get a lot of different products from those wonderful trees that we grow. Well, we're doing something a little bit different this time, is we're looking at what products that you can get out of trees that might be growing in the urban area. I mean, so often, you know, we think about trees, beautiful trees in our yards, in our homes, in our cities, in our parks, and we get the value of that and the benefits of those when they're alive. Well, there's now this whole paradigm shift that we're thinking about is, let's think about using those trees after they have to come out for whatever reason for products. Besides all the products, just think about what is not happening. We're not having to haul all this tree off to the landfill. And that's certainly a waste of space. Think about sustainability. If we can make products out of trees that are growing in our yards and in our parks right here in Oklahoma, how great is that? So we're out here just outside of Oklahoma City with a local mill that is interested in using some of those trees that traditionally might have gone off to the landfill. Oklahoma Forestry Services has recently conducted a survey of the mills all across the state. And you could go to our website and find out mills in your area that might be interested in getting some of those trees that have to be removed off of your property. So we're out here in Northwest Oklahoma City at 360 Timber Productions with the prior out here, Vaden Dean. And Vaden's nice enough to cooperate with the Oklahoma City Parks Department to really push this idea forward that there are some milling operations out there that are interested in taking some of this urban wood. So, Vaden, we really appreciate you. You're uh, welcome, Mark. Being Glad to be here. here. You know, there are some ideas that, you know, the mills are only interested in particular kind of wood. Uh, but what kind of wood uh, would you find that's uh, acceptable and, and that you might be interested in getting? You know, in the, in the urban strategy, it doesn't really matter what type of wood. And you are correct, some mills prefer to deal with just strictly certain woods. I'm looking for anything, uh, something that has a meaning, a story, something we can keep out of the landfill. Uh, it, it's just, it can be anything. Well, Vaden, I really want to thank you again for your innovation and your willingness to kind of share your craft with everybody and your willingness to, 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 to actually help, you know, use something out of a product, trees in mm -hmm. urban areas that we tend to not use much out of, particularly when they get cut. So what we're really excited about now is now that Vaden has milled all this, we're going to go to a secondary producer that is going to really make something interesting out of this wood. So here we are again uh, at the next phase of the operation. If you might remember, we saw where you could take a rough cut tree, cut it into slabs, and you have to age that for a couple of years. We then milled it to get a little bit smoother, and now we're at the next step where we're going to actually make something beautiful out of it. And with us today that are going to help us talk about that is Chad Walker with Sky K Creations. He's going to be the one that takes us through the, the next phases. So, Chad, it's so nice of you to be here with us today. Thank you. So, Chad, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on here now? Um, we've taken it through the planer, we've smoothed it off, but there's a lot of the glossy that's still on here. What, what's going on with that? Um, I'm filling the cracks with epoxy to uh, help stabilize the wood a little more. And then uh, once all the cracks are filled, We'll uh, sand it down with some belt sanders, and then we'll uh, we'll do a finish sander after after we get it all smooth. Okay, so so the epoxy really is just being used to kind of fill in some of those small cracks. Yeah, and the bigger bigger ones too. And some of the larger ones. So and and I that's part of the reason why we had to wait so long, isn't it? Because in order to turn that rough green wood into a, a beautiful piece of furniture, you have to wait 
to get it to a certain moisture content in the wood. Is right. And why is that important that you have to wait until it dries out? Um, it helps stabilize the wood. Uh, it, the wood will uh, minimize movement, uh, cupping, cracking, stuff like that. It's, it's going to continue to move, but it's, it just won't move as much as when it first is uh, green. So, if, so the drier it is, the less the amount of movement, right. uh, and then the more it's okay. going to stay yeah. the way the final creation is. Okay. Yeah. It's still going to move, but not as much. So I've noticed here in the center where they two come together, uh, there's a little bit of height difference. How are we going to be able to level that out? Um, I'm going to use these uh, dominoes, kind of like a heavy-duty uh, biscuit. From, you know, it's not more. like the dominoes my grandmother and I no. used to play. <laughs> but if, uh, you know, like Norm Abrams with the biscuit joiners, these are a little heavier duty. And uh, I have this special tool. They'll bore a hole into these edges, and I'll put these uh, dominoes in there, and they'll stick out, and it'll help everything line up right. And so we won't have much sanding to do it once we get them glued together. So I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank Woodcraft of Oklahoma City uh, because they're donating all the epoxy that we are going to be using on this table. Well, thank you so much again, Chad, for inviting us out here to see where we're at on this process. And the next time we see this, it's going to be a wonderful, finished, working piece of art. Elementary, and joining me today is CC Leonard, who is an Oklahoma County Master Gardener. And CC, we've worked with you before you because have. you're instrumental in Junior Master Gardener program. And tell us a little bit how you got started in that and what you're doing here. Uh, the Junior Master Gardener program was actually started by two Master Gardeners before me, um, and then I ended up inheriting it about five years ago. And we started out at Santa Fe South, and we started with just one garden, and that's how we developed the program. And so we developed our format at Santa Fe South. And since then, we've expanded. Sometimes we have seven schools. Next semester, we're going to have nine schools um, here in the Oklahoma City metro area. And we try to follow about the same format, because that's the only way I can handle that many schools. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're doing a lot. And today, you did a lesson on photosynthesis. I, yes. I mean, is, is obviously, you're a gardener. But tell us a little bit, is this your background teaching? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. I am, I am an engineer, and so I'm used to formality, I'm used to presentations, but I'm also used to being really serious. And so I've really had to adapt my style to get the kids to pay attention to me. So now I'm like all over the place, and I'm using my arms and waving things just to keep their attention. And they keep interested, and, and I think they really enjoy it, and they really learn that way. And it, it takes a team of master gardeners. Yes, it does. There's always somebody who's up front, but then also a lot yes. of volunteers behind the yes. scenes helping. Um, you've got about a group of six out here, I think. Yes. <laughs> and, and we're short-handed today. And, but that makes a really nice ratio. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you get out of it working with the students? Oh, I get I get a lot of satisfaction. Um, it is, I'm going to cry because it is incredibly heartwarming for me to watch these kids get back to nature. And I think that they're missing out on that. Mm -hmm. and, and you're working with fourth graders here. Would they normally be out in, no, in the garden like this? Unfortunately not. Um, uh, they don't, they don't have, I don't think they have recess here after the third grade. So these are fourth graders that are kept up inside in classroom environment. And so to get to learn about things out here in nature and we teach lessons and, and I teach a lesson and I try to make the lesson applicable to what we're going to do in the garden. Mm -hmm. So it's really hands-on learning that they do. 
Yeah. And, and what do you see the the students? How are they reacting? To oh my it? gosh! I mean, you saw it. It is complete joy. They are so excited. They run out into the garden. They hug their master gardeners. It's uh, it's just a complete joyous event. So tell me about those rain uh, days and things like that that happen in the garden or when plants die. How do you incorporate those into the lessons? Well, unfortunately, I have a lot of plants that die. <laughs> and, Don't um, we all? <laughs> yeah. And we simply discuss why they died and why they didn't produce. But the plants that do make it, like we had watermelons and cantaloupes that they got to eat. We've got a lot of really good lettuce and kale coming up. So there's always the, the, the success story that gets to kind of back it up. Unfortunately, we're not going to have carrots this year, but they'll they'll get through that, I think. So Cece, we obviously know that a garden takes more work than just the day of the lesson. It does. So who's maintaining this space? Um, there's a group of master gardeners, and we come out here on what I call maintenance days, and we try to keep the garden in some kind of good shape because the kids really don't have the time to pull all the weeds. I mean, when you see when they're out here, they're pretty busy and, and so they do a lot of that. They know about weeds and they do pull some weeds. But for the most part, you know, the group of us, we water, we pull the weeds, we um, um, plant some things if they need to be replanted. So yeah, we well, try to keep the garden up for the kids. Well, you guys are a dedicated group and we appreciate yeah. what you're doing and providing for this community. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, appreciate it. Well, my name is Ramaya and I'm in fourth grade. What I like about gardening is planting stuff. Like I planted lettuce and I uh, put straw all over it and everything. And uh, we have some beds that we uh, work on and everything, like pull roots and everything and cut some wood around the uh, plants and everything. We always come out here on Wednesdays, like every Wednesday. Do you like it better than being in the classroom? Or? Yes. <laughs> what I learned is that uh, plants need water, sun, and uh, soil and everything. Like they can grow better. And like since the, the tomatoes didn't have a lot of sun, so they kind of died. And we had to put straws over all the beds. I love being out here with my friends. And the most thing I like to plant is the uh, lettuce. My favorite things to eat out here is sorrel. It tastes like lemon. It is the season of Thanksgiving and there's so many things to be grateful for this time of year. Of course, at the top of our list is always family and friends and that definitely includes my newest little addition, Harrison, this year, but it also includes my coworkers, the garden ambassadors, and you, the viewers. Each year as we travel around the state and I get to meet you all face to face, it's so nice to hear your personal gardening stories. As I meet you, I truly feel like I learn as much about gardening from you as you might learn from the show. I feel very grateful to have a hobby and a career rooted in the gardening community. We appreciate and thank you for tuning in and bringing us into your home each week. 
While this concludes the regular season of Oklahoma Gardening, please continue to watch the best of shows throughout the winter months. And tune in especially on December 14th for a special holiday edition of Oklahoma Gardening. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Thanks for tuning in. Starting December 4th at 10 a.m., we'll begin our Oklahoma Gardening Winter Podcast Season. Join us online every other Wednesday as Casey visits with special horticultural guests and answers all of your gardening questions. Find a list of times and guests on Facebook or on our website. For the next two weeks, we will not be seen on the main OETA channel, but be sure to join us on December 14th and 15th for a special holiday episode of Oklahoma Gardening. We hope you join us in for more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.